Welcome to Network Capital TV, Neha. Uh, here we try to make sure that uh, different career principles and mental models are accessible to all our subscribers. You've had a great journey as an entrepreneur and you've currently repivoted to a different venture. Could you briefly tell us who you are and uh, what do you do today? Um, I'm a social entrepreneur. I've been, um, I'm now on my fourth uh, startup venture. Um, so I spent about a decade and a half in the creative industries, um, founded and ran an international art fair um, that I, I, I ran for 10 years and then, and then sold uh, in 2018. Uh, and also a creative communications company to then move all my attention to the world of mental health. And um, we have uh, two startups in this space. One is a, a system solution consulting firm. It's called Librem. It's in the UK. Um, and I have some of the top uh, global scientists as, as co-founders on that, um, working with governments and um, development agencies, philanthropy organizations on system solutions. Um, and then we have uh, in India, um, together with, uh, I, I joined Dr. Amit Malik at Inner R uh, last year. And uh, together, what we're looking out to build is a, is a full service um, mental health uh, here in India. So we have a digital platform at the moment, and we're building uh, a full stack uh, on that. Uh, Neha, uh, tell us about uh, some of the lessons from India Art Fair, and uh, what, was, uh, what was the most difficult aspect and the most exciting aspect of building it? And what are some lessons that you carry forward to this day in your new ventures? I mean, you know, I, I started it when I just moved back from university in London and it was sort of nothing more than an idea. Uh, so what's exciting for me is uh, the ability to pick up uh, something that most people think is not possible to do and try and have a stab at it, right? Uh, uh, I think there's something to be said about uh, sort of working uh, in sort of an unknown territory like that. Um, and a lot of my lessons come from that. Uh, also, you know, my own personal life has, has taken me through many ups and downs. And uh, so I uh, sort of fall back on, on some degree of resilience. Um, but uh, what's been interesting in this whole process is really to work in communities and work in partnerships. I think both in the art world as well as now here in, in the world of mental health. Uh, we're constantly working with partners. We're constantly building networks. And just the idea of stringing people together uh, to be able to build something that is relevant uh, to a wider uh, set of people, uh, to uh, citizens, uh, to people who earlier enjoyed art and culture and now have a need for mental health services. I think that to me is, is deeply fulfilling and uh, is something that really uh, uh, motivates me uh, to wake up every morning and, and uh, get on with it. So uh, let's dive into that. What is the inner hour? Tell us about some of the design principles and what problem are you trying to solve? So if you look at it, you know, today in, in our country, we have uh, almost 200 million people who suffer from some degree of mental illness or the other. Uh, WHO said one in every fourth person will have a mental health condition. And uh, the numbers are so large, it's almost in every household. And yet there's such little uh, service offering uh, to match the kind of need there is. Uh, for me, as someone who's seen a lot of mental health issues in my own family, um, I've seen years of psychosis, depression, and, and many other conditions, I really understand the intergenerational impact of it and, and how it impacts families overall, how it impacts our work-life balance, our, our future with our children as, as parents, and, and all of that. And so I'm really driven by the idea of um, stitching together a, a solution that can solve for people's needs um, right from the point of giving the giving information, making mental health services uh, and care more accessible, uh, building an understanding around that, uh, to normalizing it, creating communities around it, and then a full stack service offering. So Inarar is a, a, a CBT and positive psychology based uh, self help uh, platform to date. We've touched over 600,000 lives across 100 cities. Um, today, the platform's ranked uh, one of the top four or five platforms globally when it comes to depression, anxiety, self-help, uh, etc. And uh, we've had over 7 lakh people take our assessments, which they can do for free, and then get on to the self-help program. And the idea really is to take to help people with tools that they can use anonymously in the comfort of their homes whenever they want. You know, so it's 24-7 available. 
and uh, it's a series of tools and activities that help you with mild um, uh, mental health conditions and uh, various sort of needs around anxiety, around uh, sleep uh, issues, or relationship difficulties, whatever it might be. So that's that's sort of uh, the offering we have. We also have a, a network of, of therapists, so you can actually um, speak on the phone uh, in seven or eight local languages uh, to therapists from across the country. Um, and in that way, uh, the idea is to make mental health more accessible uh, and more affordable uh, and use technology uh, as a way to bring it uh, to uh, parts of the country that do not have any of the established services uh, available at their doorstep. So talk to us about the early days of this venture. So you've, um, you know, you've exited uh, India Art Fair, which is, uh, which was a huge phenomena and, uh, you know, thinking about the next steps. So what did the early, say the first hundred days of uh, the inner art look like? You know, for me, it was, um, as I mentioned to you, I, I, when I sold the art fair, I wanted to do, I wanted to come uh, to something that was uh, a cause that was really dear to me. And so it was to be mental health. And, but all I was bringing was some entrepreneurial experience and uh, a tremendous amount of lived experience that I've I personally experienced in my whole life, right through school and college and, and everything else, uh, which I actively talk about, uh, um, you know, in cohorts uh, in India or anywhere in the world. Um, and and you know, for me, it was really about trying to see what would be the most relevant way to engage in this space and what can I what can I bring. Um, and so I actually took a year off and I I went around the world. I met over 250 organizations working in mental health services uh, globally. Um, looking at the best use of technology, um, what are the kind of uh, person-centric services that are available, um, and in the course of that, um, found great partners and, and people who I could uh, sort of work together with uh, in in the way that I had imagined doing so. Um, and so came back and uh, with a focus on India uh, to begin with, but also what we develop here is is truly a global solution. And um, so in that sense, it's powered by the best uh, sort of scientific and, and global clinical expertise. Uh, my partner, Dr. Amit Malik, um, was a leading psychiatrist in the NHS. Uh, he uh, was on the board of the Royal College of Psychiatry, and he ra ran very large mental health services uh, and digital delivery of mental health uh, before moving to India to solve for this. So um, the last year or so, together with him at Inarar, has been just an amazing journey of discovery. Because, um, you know, soon enough, the COVID pandemic uh, struck and suddenly everybody was talking about mental health. So it was almost like, uh, you know, it's, it, they say never waste a good crisis. And uh, we've literally landed in a situation where there is so much conversation around it. There's so much. It's so unfortunate that the mental health needs of people uh, that have already existed have really come to the fore and so many new issues have come up. And uh, so we've, we've gone full throttle into that. Um, we've uh, created pro bono programs over the last few months uh, for frontline agencies, for healthcare workers. Um, we've onboarded lots of corporates, big and small NGOs, educational institutions. And the idea is simply to make services accessible and available at a time when people need it the most. And um, so that's been a great journey. And um, it, it really sort of puts us uh, front and center in terms of uh, being able to contribute and be relevant. Um, and lots of communities like, like yours where we're able to um, sort of be uh, bring in voices as, as clinical ambassadors, as lived experience ambassadors, uh, and really sort of hopefully spark a, a movement and an open dialogue uh, around these issues that uh, concern everybody today. So never waste a crisis. It's, it's a quite a powerful saying. So how has uh, the crisis accelerated um, the journey of the company and how have you as an entrepreneur venturing into a I would say a relatively new space for you uh, how's the process of learning been for the company and for you as a person yeah for me there have been many firsts um, I've never been um, I'm you know I, I trained as a counselor but I've never uh, been entrepreneurial in this space um, I'm not a clinician, uh, and, and in a sense, I'm surrounded by, by clinicians uh, when, when they're working in this space. And, and so, uh, but yet, it, it all sounds so familiar because I've, uh, I think I've seen uh, so many mental health institutions in the course of my life, uh, met with so many doctors. It's, 
familiar with the language, so that's um, that's been an easier uh, transition. The idea of uh, a technology delivered uh, product is new to me. I'm uh, you know I'm coming from the art world, and so there's been a steep learning curve there, um, looking at um, how we can use machine learning and uh, uh, certain algorithms to create recommendation engines for therapists to create uh, predictive modeling. Uh, to look at what consumer behavior could be like so that we can help people better, um, creating mood trackers and, and digital diaries and um, uh, all of that has been a very interesting uh, experience. And uh, so I think, yeah, that those would be some of my, my big learnings. It's also been a fun challenge going through the journey of fundraising and uh, talking to um, uh, traditional uh, capital and, uh, and, and angels who are looking at this space with curiosity and really explaining how we want to solve for this space and what is our thinking in terms of a person-centric branded service uh, and what that might look like. So lots of lots of lessons there. Uh, it's a first in terms of tech and a first in terms of uh, a fundraising journey as well. Can you talk to us in uh, more detail about tech for mental health? What are some practical things that uh, you've observed or you are observing? Um, that can help deal with uh, the mental health crisis. And also, if possible, can you define mental health for a five-year-old? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, it's it's a very interesting question because uh, we keep saying mental health, but most people don't really know what it is. And in a sense, the health of, the, like we have uh, calorie counts and so many different metrics to measure the health of our body, um, you know, but the health of our mind, uh, also must be uh, must be measured and taken care of in some ways and really mental health belongs to everybody it's just a state of you know it could uh, be to do with uh, your memory your cognitive uh, cognitive attention your eq your relationship skills all of that it contributes towards your medic uh, mental health and um, mental illness is really a problem uh, around um, uh, you know wh when certain things become maybe perhaps more of a clinical condition whether it's related to depression anxiety you know, how do you distinguish between sadness and depression, for instance? So, um, so I think a simple way of looking at it is really if there are things going on around you, whether they are in biological or chemical in your body and mind, or they are in your environment, that are taking away from your life, that are taking away your quality of sleep, the quality of your, um, you know, what you eat and how you interact in your relationships, that are making you less productive or, or less happy on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, then then it's worth sort of looking into that a bit more. Now, it could be momentary. It could just be sadness and not really clinical depression. Uh, but there's no harm in doing things to uh, in a preventive sort of way and doing things to intervene early. So what I always say is that, you know, given that almost 50% of mental health conditions you can diagnose before the age of 15, uh, the idea is all about early intervention. So in our schools, in our colleges, when we see people who are struggling in some way or the other, can we develop a vocabulary and an understanding to reach out, uh, to engage, uh, to find the support? Can we take away the hesitation that people have uh, to actually uh, getting from some form of help? And the tech platform is, is exactly for that purpose. The idea is that um, for people who are still uh, kind of uh, struggling with going to find help in, in terms of meeting a psychiatrist or a psychologist and so on, can they have an easy frictionless interaction to begin with? So technology plays a great role in many ways. It's, uh, it's accessible, it's affordable. Um, there is a lot of uh, clinical evidence now that, uh, that suggests that some level of interventions and also recovery and outcomes uh, can be generated through the use of uh, technology. And, and essentially, if you think about it, what happens in a therapist's room is what we've looked at digitizing. So taking those same modules of cognitive behavior therapy, and mindfulness and same approach to change how you're thinking and feeling um, and uh, try and bring that into the context of, uh, of a digital platform. So that's kind of how you would look at what to get out of it. And if you were to look at the journey, it's, it's, it's like saying, you know, if you have a knee problem or if you have a cold or if you have an eye problem, you would go and check it out, right? Um, even if it meant hearing from the doctor that you're fine, don't worry. Or maybe the doctor says you need some medication and then you'll be fine. Um, I think a lot of people don't really know what to expect. You know, they don't know how to think about it. They don't know what to expect. Uh, and that ignorance or that hesitation uh, tends to delay getting help. 
and uh, i don't know if you know but in india people take you know anything from 4 to 6 years to get to their first appointment uh, sometimes with a psychologist or a psychiatrist so just imagine all that can be bridged and um, you know we talk about over 1 trillion dollars loss in in economic terms we talk about 22% of the adult population suffering from uh, addiction disorders we talk about a student death every hour uh, 250000 uh, uh, deaths by suicide every year and and suicide being the largest cause of death in the young population so in 15 to 29 it's one of the largest causes of death um, those numbers are large when it comes to a country like india and so early help and accessible solutions and in our case a tech enabled approach is really what we've gone for um, that's fascinating have you observed um, people or have you observed why some people and some companies are reticent to talk about the mental health issues the some of the obvious reasons we can think of is the bias that one might face but uh, having uh, run a company and having had lived experience what are some things that people should know but don't and what are some misconceptions that you want to tell millennials about i mean the the first thing that we really must acknowledge is that it could be it could be any of us right if we're saying it's a one in four problem i mean look around us someone around us is probably struggling with some form of mental health or the other now for the most part these are actually um completely treatable conditions many of them are 100% curable and there are not that many chronic illnesses where a doctor can tell you this is 100% curable right but in many cases mental health conditions can be completely controlled in that regard right and, and managed uh, so that you have a much better life and outcome so the first thing i would say is that this hesitation or this sense of feeling lost and helpless um is something that you can get past just knowing that there are enough people there who have been through it who are going through it in and around your neighborhood and your schools and your colleges and workplaces um and so nobody is alone in this and nobody is spared from it at the same time think of it as a continuum right it's not black or white so mental health to mental illness can be a continuum and you can kind of bob in and out out of it um so there may be days when you know certain things have gone uh, down uh, south and you kind of felt like um uh, you know it's been it's been 6 8 months and you haven't been able to pull yourself out of it important to go and get help perhaps at that stage right and and maybe not just talk to friends but actually seek out professional help so the first thing i would say is that it's normal it's all around us um you know and there are lots of cures and treatments available today um you know we follow the approach of a multidisciplinary biopsychosocial approach the idea is that you you get medication if you need it you get therapy if you need it you do self help if you need it um and you work with the community and within your families right uh, your caregivers and others so so that's how you look at it right it's about talking about it it's about accepting if you need help it's not it's not defeat or a loss um in fact it's the other way around it's it's a show of great uh, a great understanding of yourself you know when you know that you're um you're not doing so good and you could do with some help um and so i would encourage everyone to see it that way and i certainly did and uh, uh, you know from the from the time i was 5 years old that my mother was showing symptoms of schizophrenia and she went untreated for 25 years and uh, in that journey we had many many struggles as a family Uh, and as a young person doing uh, all of uh, what i what i uh, did in my entrepreneurial journey with the reality of of these uh, emergency kind of situations in my personal life and, and yet you know with the right kind of help today um we you know my our family is completely rehabilitated my mother's an active grandmother in my child's life uh, and it's possible uh, for the worst of conditions it is certainly possible to have um complete integration and uh, uh, and a and a great level of sort of normalcy so i think the message of hope uh, is very important and that there are solutions available there and uh, you know at the end of the day a lot of hesitation whether it's in workplace or in universities comes from what others will think you know how will i be perceived how will i you know i will not be able to get married properly i may not be able to get a job properly and there's many of these and i guess you know we just have to ask ourselves what's more important today we are all in a lockdown or or a new normal situation um 
people have health anxieties, financial anxieties. There are so many problems that are surfacing. Um, addictions, domestic abuse, uh, all of these issues. And it's all coming from a, a sense of misalignment with yourself, right? Or a sense of being locked in, or a sense of fear, um, or insecurity. Now, we just have to ask ourselves, what would we rather do? Would we rather live with um, uh, you know, certain difficulties internally for ourselves? Uh, or would we rather face that and get, get past it and get treatment and get help um, and then have a better life, right? So that hesitation is important to take away. And actually, if you do that, then that's most of the journey is done just with that. Um, do you or have you or do you know of people who actively hire people with mental health issues? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, organizations are, um, um, you know, some organizations I am most certain have historically are discriminated against people who have any kind of issues. It could be uh, physical disabilities, it could be mental uh, health issues uh, and all of that. But today you will find that there are several. I mean, we have uh, in the last two weeks, we've onboarded over 40 corporate, uh, corporate uh, clients and we can see overall there is a cultural shift in uh, corporate India, where there's a recognition of the loss of productivity, the loss of uh, um, kind of uh, the well-being of employees and the need to invest in that. And so what we're seeing now as a trend more and more is corporates wanting to support the mental health of their organizations, uh, moving towards uh, EAP, employee assistance programs, moving towards digital apps like ours uh, that people can, uh, you know, we have a whole corporate program now um, where you can have um, uh, full access to therapy sessions, series of webinars, uh, and uh, anonymous access to the app and all of that. So these are tools that corporates are wanting to bring in more and more because they recognize. Right? So we definitely see a big shift in awareness, uh, a big shift in insight right? of people actually wanting to solve for it and not discriminate against it. And, um, and it comes from a top down kind of uh, uh, concept, right? Where leaders of organizations that are at a founder, CEO level um, have a, have a buy in for the need for wellness and, and uh, helping those who are struggling, maybe for a period of time. Um, so I think it's only a matter of time, you know, as many things. I mean, if you look at um, when we think about stigma, what comes to mind is uh, something like an IVF, right? Um, a few years ago, it was uh, it, it was nowhere in sight. And, and you know, it was a lot of uh, there was a lot of stigma that, that you couldn't have your own child. But today there are IVF centers everywhere. People proudly talk about it, um, and uh, there's no hesitation at all. So I think it's just a matter of time when you know it, it, it. There are just enough people who talk about it, enough people who own own their process of recovery and are very open, and organizations embrace it. And you know, before we know it, uh, things will change, and there'll be. There'll be more people who will uh, be endorsing it and talking about it uh, than not. So I think it's it's a long journey, but certainly a start has been made. I was I was shocked to see uh, there's over six million people on uh, Facebook communities just from India uh, on mental health, and there's about seven eight hundred uh, Google searches, uh, seven eight hundred thousand Google searches uh, a month on mental health issues. So people want that help. People want that support. People want to talk about it. Um, and there's a lot of content today on community-based platforms where people are sharing their, their experiences. So these are all positive signs of a community and a society opening up uh, and embracing it. I mean, right after this, I'm doing a talk for one of the leading schools in, uh, in Delhi. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, exactly on this and looking at how young people, uh, you know, those who have just graduated from class 12 and are looking at now um, what their future might be, how do they deal with this uncertainty? How do they deal with the challenges of the times today? So talk to us about uh, how um, you think of communities in the era of tech. So let's look at the full stack aspect of your solution or your, uh, or your vision. So there's one role of uh, technology. The other is community. There's, of course, um, destigmatization and other aspects that you've looked at. Then there is employer awareness. That, that's also important. And there's familial awareness. So uh, can you just very quickly walk us through the roles of various stakeholders and uh, how might community-based approaches be relevant to mental health? 
Yeah, I mean, unlike um, unlike uh, some of the other healthcare conditions, which is a fairly linear journey, you know, you, you have a problem with your leg, you go to the orthopedic doctor, you get some medication and, and treatment, and then it's a pill, and over a certain period of time, it gets better. Uh, but when it comes to mental health or mental illness condition, uh, there's it's a whole complex web of things, right? Uh, and, and those of us who uh, experienced it in any shape or form know that there's lots of dependencies and interconnectedness. So one is the person himself, right? The person who is struggling uh, with some issue or the other. Um, Self-harm has become a big issue right now with young people. Um, and we've seen some of the very tragic uh, deaths by suicide in recent times um, as a result of uh, depressive um, uh, disorders. So, um, you know, when you see different people act out or act in differently, um, but really the person who is struggling is at the center of it all. And it's very important that that person is is uh, playing a role in their own recovery journey, right? Uh, uh, it's it's not a it's not something that the doctor is driving. It it must be something that I can decide for myself what I need to do when, and I have the support of various constituents. And then the idea of saying that look, the, the clinicians, the psychiatrists who give you medication um, if there is a need and do a diagnosis, uh, the psychologists who do therapy and uh, to talk therapy, cognitive behavior therapy, positive psychology, all of these are, are different forms of uh, therapeutic uh, engagement. And then you have self-help applications. But what the idea of a full stack is people don't know what they need. People don't know how to solve for it, right? Uh, or what might work for them. So if we can give them a single window access where they come to one platform and over a period of time, they're able to go through an assessment. They're able to understand what their needs are, what they want to work on. They're, they're participating in that journey of discovering and also then shaping their care plan together with the doctors and their family members. Um, you know, family support is a big factor in mental health. So it's not just a, it's not just medication you need. Your environment and your influences in your around you are also important. So all of these play a role. Uh, in that and what your community is, whether it's a school or a college or a workplace becomes important, friend circles become important uh, and each one plays a role. Uh, and that role can be simply in terms of uh, a level of acceptance uh, that it's okay, right? Uh, not to judge, not to shame, not to ridicule, but just to accept, um, to be able to empathize, um, not to sympathize and say, oh, you poor thing and you know, nobody wants to feel like a victim. Uh, but just to be able to uh, empathize with that person and then be able to encourage the person in getting the help that they need. And almost always, uh, when you start on that journey, um, it can be difficult and you can keep going, exploring what to do. But again, there, if there are forces that come together and, and uh, services like ours where, where you can then look to saying, okay, I can go to one umbrella platform and, uh, and, and through that, I can access all my services. Uh, needed, then I think there's a lot of reassurance and comfort there for most people. So that's that's kind of how I would describe it. And then because these are long-term conditions, sometimes and and you can you know you can go through a depression spell, and then after a few years you can go through it again. And so there's a recurring nature to these, or you can have a miscarriage and then it can come back again, or something else that happens in life, um, the loss of a loved one, etc. So because these are long-term, so that community support that we're talking about becomes important. Could be in the form of support groups, uh, ongoing interaction with a cohort of people who are going through something similar, and uh, the idea of sharing experiences, sharing your strengths, what have you learned, what what happened to me, uh, just there is some therapy in just being able to share and being able to connect because it makes people feel belong, it makes people feel understood, and uh, everyone can relate to what's going on, and and so it feels uh, there's a sense of acceptance and courage uh, from that to keep going uh, and, and have a better life. Wonderful. Um, are there things that we can do on a daily basis to augment our you know, well-being? And uh, you know, I just want to conclude uh, this discussion with, this, uh, with some reflections on toxic negativity and toxic positivity, uh, depending on the time we have. But uh, yeah, let's start with the dig uh, with uh, some behavioral aspects of our daily life. Yeah, well, I think it's um, the the basics that we are all aware of, uh, and if some of them are off, then we should figure out uh, why. Uh, but um, just the ability to uh, 
uh, eat on time, sleep on time, take care of your wellness, uh, have a level of social connection. Um, physical distancing and isolation doesn't necessarily mean social distancing. Um, and so to be able to connect with family and friends, journal and, and to find ways of expressing uh, how you feel. I think these are all important things that we just must do on a re regular basis and do small things that create a sense of well-being. You know, uh, when things become difficult, which they will sometimes, and when it's challenging to try and break it down, take it one day at a time, one hour at a time. Um, you know, they say make it bite-sized uh, until it's you're able to sort of work through that. So try and give yourself, don't put yourself down for challenging times uh, or negative feelings. Just accept that it's okay. It's okay to be scared. It's okay to not have a plan, to not have answers, to be in a difficult situation. Um, so a little bit of self-love and self-compassion, I think, is uh, these are some of the, the obvious important things we should do every day. Um, and whatever it is that, that creates that uh, feel good uh, for us, whether it's lighting candles or, or soaking in a, in a warm bath. Got it. And in today's age, uh, there's a lot of expectation to be positive. Everyone, you know, sends good morning and good evening messages and people are usually sharing stuff online. Uh, some of it can be pressurizing for a you know, regular person down the street. Um, do you have some advice for dealing with toxic positivity that sort of implies that you need to be positive all the time? And the flip side of that as well, toxic negativity that no matter what happens, I mean, life is coming to an end. I mean, what I would say is that both are slightly unreal and do, don't last beyond the time. Right? Uh, and so it's important to recognize, it's important to just be real. And and what I mean by that is, for me, you know, there will be ups, there will be downs, there will be days when I would want to cry my eyes out, but there will be days when I will be happy and relaxed doing absolutely nothing, uh, when nothing special has happened, right? And, and so we're all going to go through all sorts of emotions and all sorts of days. Um, either we can absorb those emotions and be, be one with them and, and you know, sort of um, really bring in that sense of whether it's shame or rejection or dejection or whatever we might be feeling. Or we can kind of accept that, look, it's, you know, take a helicopter view of your own life. That from 30,000 feet, you know, you can see that things are going to come and go, things are going to churn. Um, and look at feelings a little bit like that, you know, like um, the waves of the ocean. They will come and go and... and you know, you, you can just, um, if you don't fight it uh, and you don't contest it, it, uh, it eventually goes away. Um, I think, yes, there is an issue with uh, this, this social media induced uh, desire to be positive uh, and project a certain image. Um, and if you think about where that's coming from, our need for validation, our need for value, recognition, um, wanting to feel like we've got it all together and, and we've got a great life. Um, sometimes we tend to lose the connection with ourselves while doing that, you know. And so again, what's more important, you know, how you're feeling inside your skin or how you look outside, right? Um, so to me, it's and even if it's a trade-off, I would make that trade any day because, um, frankly, I've got to live inside my skin for the rest of my life. Uh, but the external environment would keep changing. Come COVID, come a new Facebook uh, avatar, right? So I think that's that's sort of the way we need to look at it. It's about strong boundaries, um, ring fencing, and protecting our mental health. Uh, not letting in all the garbage and all the noise um, and not letting it affect us and, and uh, certainly not letting it affect our sense of self, right? Um, so some kind of boundaries is very important uh, so that you can filter what goes in and out. And uh, especially in, in today's digital age, uh, we, we, would, uh, we would all need to do that. Thank you, Neha. This has been a fascinating discussion. Where can people... Um find uh, inner r and some of the interesting services that you're offering what's your uh, suggestion there absolutely i would i would urge um, anyone who's curious and just wants to explore to look at look at some of our social media um, content uh, we've got a uh, we have a website and, a, and an app of course uh, it's the it's called the inner hour um, and you can get it uh, on any of your handsets and uh, uh, take free assessments, uh, get a sense of where you're at, and then uh, some of the self-help journeys and modules that are there. Um, it's It's been made in a way that it's engaging and playful, um, and at the same time, it's meaningful and gives you some outcomes. So I hope you enjoy your journey of exploration and reach out and connect uh, when, uh, whenever any, any, of, uh, any of these tools and services might be handy. Um, I think the Inner R team would, uh, would love to... Uh, 
I'd love to connect and, and hear from you. Thank you, Neha. This has been a delight hosting you, and we look forward to more such uh, discussions. Thank you. Thank you.